My name is Renee Wallace. I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar on racial equity in the food system. Uh, no, food sovereignty. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, introducing our group. <laughs> food sovereignty and the role of extension, partnerships that work. Uh, we welcome you to the webinar today. We are going to be introducing the topic of food sovereignty and looking at how and why the principle is used in different First Nation communities. Following the introduction, our two partners will share, three of our partners will share with you their experiences. They'll describe how partnerships were developed and key elements of those partnerships that promote food sovereignty. At the end of the presentations, there'll be time for question and answers. And as you've just heard, you can put questions in the Q&A box. And those of us who are helping facilitate will answer questions along the way, as well as our presenters uh, sharing answers in the Q&A section. In addition, once the webinar is completed, we will be sending the recording along with the slides to all webinar participants. With that, I'll introduce you to Rich Pirat, who is the director of the MSU Center for Regional Food Systems. Thank you very much, Renee, and welcome everybody. This is our third, uh, this is the third webinar, national webinar for the Racial Equity in the Food Systems Work Group. Just to give you some context, this is the primary coordinator and sponsor for this webinar. Uh, it's a, this group is a community of cooperative extension professionals and community stakeholders who connect, learn, and collaborate to facilitate change within our institutions to build racial equity within the food system. And although we have some focus on cooperative extension, our webinars have uh, been um, attended by um, multiple nonprofits across the country and in other countries as well, Canada and Western Europe and uh, as well as government officials, private uh, consultants, just individuals, uh, and, and really all, 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 all folks that are connected to the food system, hospitals, you name it. So uh, what you're looking at is the, is the committee members of the Racial Equity in the Food System group. We are a national group, and there are members uh, across the country that, are, um, that uh, meet monthly and generate, one of the main pro uh, tasks is to generate uh, the content uh, ideas for these webinars and uh, the work that we continue to do to try to uh, help uh, 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 include a racial equity lens in our food systems work nationally. Uh, so that's a, a bit of context. And we're going to do a, a quick poll question before we start our presentation. You're seeing the poll question on your screen, but you're going to be able to take the poll. Uh, it's going to show up as a box. Uh, on your uh, screen. If you would please, this question, I'll read it, is uh, to what extent does your organization work with First Nation communities in your state or region? So please try to respond to this question. Uh, and uh, when, when we finished, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the presentation. We'll, we'll wait uh, no more than one minute. Rich, while we're uh, waiting for people to fill out the, the poll question, we did have a question in the chat. Um, someone is saying that their part of their screen is being cut off and how you can fix this is up at the top of the screen, you will see an option that says view options with a drop down arrow. If you click on that, you can alternate between fit to window and original size. And uh, that should fix any problem that you might have with how it is uh, viewed on your computer. Okay. Gwen, will you be able to end the poll? Yes. Okay, let's end it in five seconds. If you haven't ended it already. One second ahead. Okay. So just a quick look here, uh, just so you can see who, what the response was here. Uh, uh, close to fifty percent of uh, people that are currently participating in the in the webinar say they work to a limited extent with First Nation communities. Uh, about twenty percent say they do. The, I'm sorry, about forty percent say that either they do not work with. Uh, First Nation communities or they don't know, and then uh, a small percent, about 13 percent, work with First Nations communities extensively, and there are several individuals on this webinar currently that are either members and, and or uh, members of First Nation communities that work with an extension. So thank you for, for giving us that information. That'll be helpful as we, uh, and I hope that's also helpful for the presenters. 
So we're going to move on, and I'm, we're going to open up the mic first for Rachel Linwall, who will introduce our first presenter, Janie Hip. Do we have her on? Janie, I just unmuted you. You want to unmute Rachel to introduce her? Sorry, I was muted. Away we go. <laughs> My name is Rachel Linval, and um, I work for the South Dakota State University with an office on the Rosebud Reservation in Mission, South Dakota. It's my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce our first speaker, and she is Janie Sims Hip. Um, before serving as the CEO of the Native American Agriculture Fund, Janie Sims Hip, who is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, was the founding director of the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative at the University of Arkansas. Prior to launching that initiative, she served as the National Program Leader for Farm Financial Management, Trade Adjustment Assistance, Risk Management Education, and the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Nat National Institute for Food and Agriculture. She was thereafter selected as the Senior Advisor for Tribal Relations to Secretary Tom Vilsack and Director of the Office of Tribal Relations. Prior to her work in Washington, D.C. at the national level, she enjoyed a lengthy domestic and international career spanning more than 35 years in the agriculture sector as an agriculture and food lawyer and policy expert. Her work focuses on the complex intersection of Indian law and agriculture and food law. Ms. Hip holds a Juris Doctor from Oklahoma City University and an LM, LLM degree in Agriculture and Food Law from the University of Arkansas. She is the author of numerous publications, most recently joining with Wilson Pipestem, Crystal Echo Hawk, and uh, oh, to author the Feeding Ourselves Report, and thereafter a Regaining Our Future Report with Colby Doran also holds a Juris Doctor degree. She serves as an advisor to the Shakopee and Duwakaton Community Seeds of Native Health campaign and numerous other campaigns focusing on food, agriculture, health, and economic development in Indian country. She was most recently received the National Center for American Indian Economic Development's 2017 Tim Wapato Public Advocate of the Year Award. So with that, we, we're proud to present Janie. Thanks, Rachel. And I'm assuming unless somebody's flailing their arms that everyone can hear me all right. And Rich, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Good. Um, so I just have to warn everybody ahead of time that I am absolutely notorious for giving you more slides than you could possibly want. You can probably tell from that that I have had an extension appointment in my past. So I like for people to walk away from any time we gather up and talk to each other, um, really having a lot of information um, at their disposal. Um, I'm available. The last slot I've got um, gives you my contact information. I'm honored to serve as the Chief Executive Officer of the Native American Agriculture Fund. And Rich, let's just keep plowing through. I'm giving you more than you can possibly want, so I'm going to have Rich go pretty quickly, and I'll be around to answer questions. So so, oh, Rich, let's advance the slides. So, um, I, I did want to spend just a second uh, letting everyone on the call, um, the webinar today, know about the Native American Agriculture Fund. It was, it is the largest philanthropic organization solely devoted to serving the Native American agriculture community. It's a 20 year private charitable trust that will be in existence until September 2038. Uh, the mission of NAF, as we call it, is to provide grant funding in the following areas. I'm not gonna read those to you, you can read them yourself. Uh, but we are controlled by a trust agreement that was put in place after the um, settlement and ultimate um, exhaustion of appeals in the Keep Siegel case. Um, many of you on the call probably know of that case. It was a case that was in the uh, court system for almost 20 years against USDA. Rich, if you'll advance the slide, 
Um, I did provide a you a little bit of background to that. I did want you to to know why the fund exists and what we're going to be focusing on. Um, and actually, we have our first request for application period that's open right this very minute. It closes September the 30th um, of, later this month. So um, this slide gives you a little bit of sense of the background of how uh, the fund came to be. The Keepsable case involved access to credit issues, which in many communities can be one of the touch points for um, discrimination as well as um, the lack of equity as the uh, demonstrable um, fact. And so when this case wound its way through the court system, we ended up with um, one of the outcomes being the creation of this fund. And so um, very honored to be a part of that moving forward. And as you can see in the last line, we started up in July of 2018. So we literally are uh, just uh, on the ground floor of this important um, new component that I hope can bring a lot of resources to bear on the issue of food sovereignty. So uh, Rich, can you advance? This slide. Um, this slide is just fairly simple. Um, I'll let you study it later some other time. Uh, it really kind of divides up how the funds were settled and you can see how much is going to be going into the fund itself. Uh, we have around 266 million that we are responsible for spending down within the 20-year time period of our creation. Next slide please. Um, we have several uh, uh, trustees. We have 14. Uh, they are listed here. And it's interesting to note uh, that this, uh, this fund is totally um, managed by uh, Native folks. Uh, every single trustee is a member of a citizen of a tribe um, of, of various locations around the country. And I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. Uh, we meet regularly. We are um, really focused right now on the request for applications and, and the decisions that will come uh, after that. Next slide, please. Um, there are some restrictions on the funding. I'm going to let you study those later. We can't do lobbying. We can't do political activities. Um, we cannot do uh, grants or loans to individuals, but we have a lot of areas that we can fund. And if you actually look at the request for applications that's open right now, you'll see that we are requesting applications for projects focused specifically on food sovereignty. So I'm so glad, Rich, to, that you all uh, reached out and this is a very timely webinar for us and I hope for the listeners. Next slide. Um, so what is tribal food sovereignty? I get this uh, question a lot. I'm actually at the native, uh, the fourth annual Native Nutrition Conference. Um, it's been hosted for four years in a row by the Shakopee Minnewaka to the Sioux community as a part of their Seeds of Native Health um, national um, uh, commitment. And there are, uh, at last count, I did go down and take a look, there are probably eight or nine hundred uh, attendees of this conference. So any of you who are on the webinar, I urge you to kind of put this in your things to do uh, list because food sovereignty is literally on the lips of everyone who's in attendance downstairs. And so the minute I get done with you, I'm going back downstairs uh, because there are a wide variety of topics that are being covered around the issue of tribal food sovereignty. But I can say it in a nutshell. Uh, prior to European contact, Native communities um, on this continent had um, the benefit of uh, a very ancient food systems in various locations with communities that thrived and were extremely dependent on their food systems that were actually quite, um, quite uh, complex, if you will. Um, Careful management of natural resources occurred, agricultural practices, uh, centuries and, and thousands and thousands of years in existence. Uh, Well-balanced diets rich with nutrients were maintained. But when uh, colonization happened, the relationships with the land and knowledge systems were severed and became increasingly challenged over time. And as a result, Native communities are now and remain among the most food insecure in the country. 
But in a nutshell, food sovereignty is defined as the inherent right of a people to define their own diet and therefore shape their own food systems. Next slide. Um, good food is essential to all people, uh, but it is also essential to healthy, strong tribal nations. Um, it's really important to really think about the complexity of what food sovereignty and food systems, solid food systems are. And having access to healthy food is a component having access to foods that are culturally appropriate, um, adequately compensating people who provide the food, distributing food in ways that ensure and improve health among communities, um, grow, gather, hunt, and fish in ways that are maintainable over the long term. And for us, it's uh, utilizing our uh, tribal treaty rights and upholding policies that ensure we have continued access to our traditional foods. Next slide. I did include this uh, definition because it has been in use internationally for quite some time. If you just think about what I just said, you'll see that many of the components of, of this uh, food sovereignty definition that emerged in 1996 in the Via Campesina uh, movement really kind of speak to exactly what I just went over with you. Next slide. Um, the Forum for Food Sovereignty um, that occurred in Mali in 2007 actually covers a lot of the same topic areas. But what I'll tell you more than anything, and, and you can keep uh, advancing the slide and I'll, you can read those later, um, is food and agriculture policy, um, I will throw you into the legal quagmire just for a moment, um, is built upon a very complex system of international law and policy, uh, federal agriculture and food law and policy, state laws, local laws, and now uh, tribal laws that are being passed and put in place by Native nations. There was actually, um, in the conference that I'm here with today, um, an entire panel this morning for multiple hours around uh, Native uh, policies that are being um, entertained and enacted by tribal governments who have control within their own tribal jurisdictions with regard to matters related to food. And I think our speakers who are coming up behind me uh, can perhaps speak to some of these issues because I believe Gary Besaw, who was formerly the chairman, has actually was on the podium <laughs> a little while ago. So keep going, please. Um, this slide I'm not going to read to you either. Uh, tribal governments do have a role in food sovereignty, but I will tell you that that equally important and probably more important than the role of tribal governments is the role of individual actors, individual people, native people within their own communities, acting individually within their families, within their extended families, but also within their broader community. So there really is a role for all of us within our native nations, within our native communities, to, to grab hold of, if you will, our particular role within food sovereignty as a movement, but also food sovereignty as we express it um, internally and at home. I am a, such a data nerd, and I'm so apologetic for that, but I do have <laughs> a prior extension appointment, so I'm kind of used to having to pull out the data. But I did want to share with you, and I'm going to go th through these very quickly. I apologize for that, but it just there's too much to talk about here. And what I found have found over my experiences over the last 35 years is sometimes we within Native nations don't even know all this data, much less extension research or education professional professionals within the land grant system. And if you, Rich, if you'll remember back to the question that started everybody off, most of the folks on this webinar have not engaged with Native Nations uh, very often. And so I do believe that the best thing that we can possibly do um, if we um, have any part of our lives within the land grant and extension system is to know who we're talking to and to quit talking just to each other and to start talking with the Native Nations who surround you. And I will share with you, I don't know where everybody's from, today, but I would bet you that most of the folks on this webinar can see themselves somewhere on this map. And if you will see, Native uh, producers are everywhere on this map. 
um, the farm credit system actually has a deeper dive on this map and they can show native producers throughout and food people throughout the country. Next slide. Uh, this is the same sort of map uh, uh, presentation from the 2012 census. The previous map was from the most recent census, and they are just now releasing uh, at NAS uh, the uh, specialized American Indian reservation data. So anyone who is within the land grant system, no matter what your role is, if you have a desire to engage Native nations and learn more about food sovereignty, I really encourage you to do your homework. Uh, understand who you're living around and whose land you may be on. Next slide. This, the whole rest of the slide deck until the very end literally goes through and tries to slice and dice, which I am prone to do, some of what the most recent census is showing us. So one of the takeaways that I am, I am constantly amazed with is that native farms tend to be twice the size of white farms across the US. So a lot of folks don't ever dig into this information and so they don't really understand the, what we do know. Um, and it is not even complete. NAS itself will tell you that they are, uh, we probably are about um, half undercounted, um, at least. So um, it is important to get a fix on this. The food sovereignty movement in Indian country is, uh, is on fire. <laughs> and I will tell you, I bet Brian said, will say that, and Rachel, I bet Erin will say that as well. It's hard to go to any tribal conference or convening without something being said and done about food and about food access and about reviving and, and creating more sustainable food systems within our communities. This is literally not, I, I don't see any stone left unturned at this point. And it's a very exciting time to be talking about these issues. And I'm really thankful that, that, that Rich and his colleagues invited me to speak on this. And I'm just going to just keep plowing uh, because I don't, I, I really am very close to wanting to turn this over to the other speakers. I could go on about this for a long time, as you can probably imagine, 35 years in this space, and I have a lot to say. Uh, but we, we will, if we can try to close in about, say, three minutes. Take me to the very last slide. And you'll see once you go through it, uh, Rich, that there's a lot there to dissect and to digest. And the reason why, keep, just keep going till you get to the end. I've actually given you county data here, which are close by headquarters of tribal governments so that you can actually see how many producers are actually showing up in the census. But I did want to leave you with this. Um, NAF as an organization is gonna be doing a lot in this whole arena of food sovereignty but we are not meant to replace the role that Extension has had a responsibility to fulfill since its inception. Um, Extension as an organization, and I would share with you the research and education community, haven't yet fulfilled their responsibilities to Native communities. 1994 tribal colleges and universities play an important role within Native communities, but they don't exist in all Native communities. So this idea that the tribal colleges will cover this waterfront and make sure every, every Native nation um, it ha is, is dealt with, you know, on a fair and equitable basis is ridiculous because tribal colleges do not exist in every nook and cranny of Indian country. But understanding Native food sovereignty and the movement that's currently sweeping across Indian country is a predicate to actually starting to meet your particular office's responsibilities. And I say this very specifically and pointedly because I really do believe in the role of the research um, extension and education system. Um, being a servant partner to your counterparts in the 1994 tribal colleges is really important. And being a servant partner to tribal governments and the the reason why I say servant partner is because that is our job is to serve. 
It is not our job to override and, and control what tribal colleges put forward and how they work within their communities. And I will tell you straight up that tribal governments and native peoples, native communities across the country are gonna do this work regardless. We are deeply involved in food sovereignty and food systems rebuilding, and we're excited about it. There's so many amazing things that are happening, but your work must be preceded by an understanding and an improvement of your own knowledge. And I really um, am thankful for Michigan State to have take, taken the lead. I'm so happy to know of this, the racial equity conversations that are happening. And if there's anything that we can do to, to assist in that, we will, uh, because it is very important that food sovereignty take hold and just continue to grow and, and spread across Indian country. That's my um, contact information, and I'm going to sit back and I'm going to listen to Aaron and Brian now. Thank you all. Yeah. Hi, wonderful, Janie. Thank you so much for that. And we absolutely appreciate the fact that you've loaded us with information in your presentation and things that we can uh, look to uh, learn even more beyond the presentation today. Uh, Aaron Piet, a member of our work group, is now going to introduce our next speakers. Thank you, Aaron. And we'd just like to remind you that you have roughly about eight minutes for your comments. And then we will go to Q&A after the next two speakers. And also, Janie, uh, people are asking questions in Q&A. Just to remind you that you can pop in and answer questions as we go. Thank I'm you. I'm doing for it. Erin's <laughs> to you. Thanks, Renee. Hi, everyone. I'm Erin Piad. I'm with uh, the University of Wisconsin Division of Extension, and I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin on the ancestral land of Ho-Chunk Nation. And I'm really happy to have this opportunity to introduce our next two speakers, Jennifer Gothier and Brian Kalkowski. Jennifer K. Gothier is an enrolled member of the Menominee Nation. She's worked in her community for over 20 years. Jennifer worked for the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin for nearly 15 years, with half of those years spent in administration overseeing more than 10 tribal departments. For the last six years with the University of Wisconsin Division of Extension, Jennifer has taken extension programming and resources and adapted them to fit the needs of the community. Jennifer's work is unique and her years working with the tribe gave her an in-depth understanding of community and political systems to help her do the work she does. Jennifer has a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in political science and a master's of public administration from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Outside of work, Jennifer is the chair of the Menominee Language Culture Commission, and she has dedicated her spare time to assisting with language and cultural arts revitalization. Brian Kalkowski started at the College of Menominee Nation in 2007 as Assistant Director of Education Outreach Extension, and prior to that, he worked for the Menominee Tribal Government for nine years, first as a land use planner and then as a community resource planner. His current position as Dean of Continuing Education requires him to manage and administer all grants and contracts of the department and act as the Extension Director. He analyzes community data to determine appropriate activities to be undertaken by the department, and he also works with different community agencies to establish cooperative working relationships. He's involved with numerous local, state, and federal professional organizations, representing his college and 1994 tribal land grant schools. Thank you again to Jennifer and Brian for sharing your work with us, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Erin. Um, uh, so first, it's important to start with who we are. The orange area on the map shows both Menominee ancestral territory and our current reservation. We were removed from 10 million acres of land, which we cared for and had a relationship with, to just over 230,000 acres through a series of treaties in the 1800s. Uh, the Menominee don't have a migration story, and this area has always been our home. Uh, while we're known um, in Wisconsin as the Menominee, the people of the wild rice, we call ourselves Mamache Tawak, or the movers. Next slide. Our relationship with food. So it was only a generation or two ago uh, that we were practicing and living true food sovereignty. We maintained a relationship with our environment and continued to rice and harvest wild foods. We hunted and we grew our food sustainably. Uh, you'll see these pictures from the early 1900s that show this way of life. 
We have our own knowledge systems, our own 13 moon calendar that helps tell us when we should be doing certain activities. We have cultural teachings associated with those activities. And we know that if we take care of these things and maintain those relationships that they'll continue to be there for us. When I was asked to share what food sovereignty meant to Menominee, this is what comes to mind. Next slide. Our county health rankings. So sadly, we moved so far away from these as a result of boarding schools, federal legislation, and the introduction of Western systems into our daily life. I'm gonna talk about these county health rankings because it's such an important data set for our community, and it's a good visual of how boarding schools and the rest impacted Menominee life. As you can see, we're ranked last in all of Wisconsin's counties as um, being the least healthy. Uh, you'll see the health disparities between Menominee and the rest of the state. As is the case for many Native communities, we increasingly became known and defined by our statistics. Um, it was important for us to recognize this and to understand the data and to do something about it. And over time, we took control of that narrative and we became empowered by the data and used this data as a source of strength. Uh, local many, locally, many of our service providers within the reservation began to look at language, culture, and community knowledge as a source of, source of strength. And our food sovereignty work in Menominee is reflective of this. Next slide. Outreach, education, and building capacity. So Menominee Food Sovereignty isn't linear and we're ever evolving. Um, our outreach, education, and building capacity are not standalone undertakings for us and they're all related to each other. Our work is focused on building community by connecting our members to resources of the university, the college, and our indigenous knowledge. And when I say our, this includes the Division of Extension, College of Menominee Nation, Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, Menominee County, and our community grassroots groups. Um, we've had to work collective, collectively to make change. Also, all of our outreach, education, and capacity building thoughtfully integrates Menominee history, language, and culture. This has to be a part of our work because this is who Menominee are, and all of this is our path to wellness. Next slide. Understanding our local needs. So to do our work well, we've made it our goal to continually reach out to community and our local partners to ask what the needs are. And this last year, we as service providers needed to pause our work and engage with community in understanding food sovereignty. As service providers, we were using terms that didn't resonate with the community, the term food sovereignty itself. And what we found was that we were talking about the same things, we were just using different words. When we asked our community about food sovereignty, uh, one person said, oh, you mean being Menominee? Um, this resonated with the rest of the group and further they believed our food sovereignty work should be a system where we reliant on ourselves and not grocery stores and any other off-reservation food sources. We've learned so much by engaging with community and using surveys. Evaluation provides us with good information to refine and adapt our work. We're so thankful to the First Nations Development Institute for giving us culturally appropriate tools to do this work. Uh, you see a picture here of our garden workshop series. We titled this Garden Time is Family Time. The series was built around community needs assessment, and as a result, we had standing room only for six weeks of the series. Next slide. Here are pictures of a community outreach event, uh, outreach event that continues to evolve. As part of our food sovereignty work, there's a collective of departments that have been working together to distribute seeds and plants to the community. In our early efforts, the seed and plant distribution consisted of leaving boxes of seeds at different locations throughout the reservation. While we were providing a good, we were missing the opportunity to engage with people, to share information, and to see what needs existed. So over time, we moved from leaving boxes to the event you see here. The event is now called Annette Sequenasinaya, or we've made it to spring. At this community event, we're providing community members with heritage seeds, providing the language related to the seeds, and engaging our youth in planning and incorporating our traditions. Our elders pray for our growing season, and we're revitalizing our Menominee planting and harvesting dances. This is only one example of our collective outreach, education, and capacity building. Next slide. Menominee harvesting. So in partnership with the College of Menominee Nation, we've been able to create learning spaces where community members interested in learning how to harvest food can do so. We've held seasonal workshops teaching community members how to harvest maple syrup, how to harvest and process wild rice, and how to identify native plants. These spaces are immersed in language, culture, history, and engages community in hands-on learning. Because of our partnership with the College of Menominee Nation, 
we're able to not only provide the learning space, but also give participants the resources to continue these practices after the workshops are over. This has been transformative learning where we're connecting to our name, Mamache Tawak, in a really meaningful way. Next slide. Menominee Agriculture and Gardening. So our ag and, gar ag and community gardening work continues to grow. Uh, we've only begun to build community capacity through our seed and plant distributions, but we're working to grow our indigenous foods using our traditional and sustainable practices. We're also building a group of our own educators, and we have our own Omat no Manewuk Master Gardeners, a well-known extension program. Our group has been active for over three years, and in that short time, they've contributed over $15,000 in volunteer and education services to the community. Above, you see pictures of our Menominee Immersion Club, um, a group of youth planting a boiled dinner garden, a garden which grew vegetables specific to one of our local dishes. We also have a picture of our Bear Island Flint Corn, a northern Minnesota seed that grows well in our short growing seasons. Next slide. Our work with non-native partners. So we're working with UW-Madison in our seeds research, and we'll be exploring other opportunities to begin rematriating seeds. Michigan State University has developed an outstanding relationship with the College of Menominee Nation and co-hosts training opportunities like IPSI and the Menomans Women's Group. Montana State University has been instrumental in helping our community share this work at an international level, while also engaging this extension educator in creating culturally engaging content through the Turtle Island Tales. What all of our partners recognize is that Menominee is at the forefront of this work, and that researching our community and our health issues isn't the focus of their work. Journals and publishing aren't the goal, and that's why these partnerships work. Next slide. Uh, our land to land grant to land grant partnership. Uh, the Extension and College of Menominee Nation partnership is unique and to my understanding is the first of its kind in the country. So our relationship is successful because it's based in reciprocity. We work to help each other and make the best use of our resources. We've built a strong trusting relationship with each other where regular communication, openness, and fairness are standard. It also helps that we're co-located on campus. Also, all the work we do is for the community work we work in. We're not focused on our individual departments or programs. Our decision making is always with the community in mind. Lastly, it's important to share that we have a common goal. Our goal is a healthy Menominee community, and we recognize that our food sovereignty work is one component of this overall goal. The picture you see on this slide is reflective of our relationship with the College of Menominee Nation. Together, we planted the Menominee version of a Three Sisters garden. The corn, beans, and squash grow together, nourish each other, and support each other, much like this 1862 and 1994. With that, I want to say, and I want to thank you for allowing us to share our work and our collective journey. Annette. Okay, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, excellent job, and I want to say thank you to Aaron for the introduction. Um, I want to say I appreciate the opportunity to be able to, uh, to work with, with you guys on doing this, this presentation on food sovereignty and to be able to share what we're doing here on the Menominee Reservation. Um, as Aaron indicated, I am from the College of Menominee Nation and we are a tribal college located in Wisconsin. Next slide, please. So just a little background. I know Jennifer gave you some background already, but uh, we are located 45 miles northwest of Green Bay in Wisconsin. Um, you can actually see us on this map here. The, the darker green is all the forested areas in Wisconsin, um, the areas that have not been cut over or cleared for farming. So the, you can actually see the, the boundaries of the reservation just from an aerial photograph because of all the forest. Um, as she indicated, it's made up of 235,000 of forest land that has been sustainably managed by the Menominee for over 100 years. Uh, the tribe runs a sawmill that employs local members and is well known for its lumber and forest products. Um, the Menominee is also rural and the total population right around 4,500. Um, I'm actually going to move on to the next slide. Jennifer gave you some background on the health statistics, so I'll just jump right into the next slide. Um, so the college is uh, a tribal college that was chartered by the Menominee people in 1993. Um, it received its land grant status in 1996 and has its main campus and community in, in, in the community of Kashina with a satellite campus in Green Bay that serves the United Nation. Uh, from a food sovereignty standpoint, the college works with 
with, uh, with my department, Department of Continuing Education, uh, which oversees, like, like was mentioned, the, uh, the tribal extension programs, uh, the College's Sustainable Development Institute, uh, the local UW Extension, which Jennifer is a part of, and the, uh, the most recently we've been able to partner with uh, TCU with the VISTA program, which has allowed us to bring in an AmeriCorps VISTA each year to help us out with, with what we're doing. Next slide. So as indicated earlier, the reservation was and still is heavily forested to the point that some areas have little disturbance as a result of Western agriculture. Uh, the Menominee were considered hunters and gatherers for years and years, and there was little proof that any of the agriculture occurred among the Menominees. In the early 2000s, uh, the college brought a well-known tribal archaeologist onto its staff by the name of Dr. David Overstreet. Uh, Dr. Overstreet had been working with the tribe's historic preservation officer for many years. Um, the intent was to try to, uh, to, to get the people in the community uh, give them an understanding about the preservation and ancient sites on the reservation and its importance. Uh, so also we have the, as, as mentioned, we had the sawmill, uh, which is run by the Menominee Tribal Enterprises. And the, the forestry department, the foresters who go out in, into the forest and, and mark the trees, uh, they had indicated for a number of years that they saw these, these areas where it, it seemed like there was a disturbance and symmetrical lines um, in, deep in the forest. So um, when Dr. Overstreet and his team went out and inspected these sites, they, uh, they felt that these could possibly be ancient gardening techniques conducted by the Menominee. Um, so in order to conduct a proper investigation, what we did is, is we applied for a, a tribal college research grant through USDA NIFA, and we received the Sustainable Organic Agriculture Menominee Legacy Grant. Um, and Dr. Overstreet was determined to prove um, that the Menominee were indeed farmers and gardeners and not just hunters and gatherers. Uh, it later turned out that these sites, after he thor thoroughly inspected these sites, uh, they weren't just these small garden areas that the foresters were finding, but they were vast acres of land that was that raised beds were, uh, were being developed on uh, many, many years ago. Um, and he able, was able to, uh, to date seeds of corn and beans all the way back to AD 800 to 1450 uh, by working with partners from UW-Milwaukee, UW-Madison, and the Smithsonian. Next slide. So here you can see some of the untouched garden beds um, that, that were, were um, inspected, found by the foresters, and, and Dr. Overstreet and his crew were able to go out and, um, and and analyze them. Um, the storage pits in the middle were, were like a, a refrigerator or freezer for the ancient Menominees. That's where they stored their food. And again, these are all areas that were untouched by uh, Western civilization. So, so this is what it looks like right now out on, right out on the, uh, on the forest, forest floor. Um, the picture on the right is actually a, a profile of, of one of the, the digs that occurred. Um, in one of these sites, and you can see the, the kind of blackish soil uh, in the middle there, and that's actually uh, uh, muck from the, from the bottom of a, a river. And what the Menominees did was they, they carried this up into their garden areas to make the soil more nutrient, because they realized that uh, the soil they were using uh, did not have the nutrients needed to grow the, the food that they were trying to grow. Um, so, so you can see that even though, um, there was not a lot to, for them to have available to them. They were able to utilize what was on the forest floor and within the, within the nature to, to grow their food and, and be very sustainable. So um, next slide. So that being said, uh, we've been able to uh, get the community really involved. Um, the community decided, you know, when they heard all this, this newfound data and, and information, uh, they became very excited about, about the idea that the Menominee were actually gardeners and farmers. Um, they, they saw this as, as something really cool now. Farming and, and agriculture was actually cool. And like Janie said, you know, it, it really lit that fire. And, um, and, and so we, we've been able to capitalize on that um, from, from a USDA NIFA standpoint and tribal extension standpoint here and, um, and bring in a lot of resources and, and try to, to, to work with uh, individuals in the community and luckily, we've been able to do a, a summer program called the Menominee Youth Heritage Program uh, with a special emphasis grant from the USDA 
and uh, we, we were able to bring in youth for the summer. They went out with Dr. Overstreet to, to do some of the digs. And actually on the, the right-hand side there, you can see where they were planting a raised bed garden, similar to the one that ancient Menominee ancestors were growing. Um, in addition, they were able to travel down to the Great Cahokia site and, and visit there and, um, and, and see that. And, and so we, they really got a really good experience. Uh, there was 12 local Menominee youth aged 13 to 18. Next slide. So at the same time, as Jennifer was saying, we, we, started, to, uh, we started to create a partnership with, uh, with our UW Extension. Prior to, uh, prior to that, we, we didn't really have a really good relationship as of 1994 with our 1862. Um, we would have meetings uh, once a year maybe, and the folks would come up from Madison, we'd meet, they'd go back to Madison, and we, we wouldn't talk anymore. Finally, we decided that um, we're not going to meet with, with our 1862 anymore if we're not going to be able to make something out of it. Um, that was when we decided we needed to first build our relationship before we could uh, build our partnership. Um, so from, from that standpoint, we had some goals that we wanted to come up with, and we wanted to collaborate with communities and identify their educational needs. That was the most important because we didn't want to come in and tell the communities what they wanted to hear. We, we, we wanted to hear what they needed, and we would look for that information then. Um, so we wanted to build on this local knowledge, the, the knowledge that Dr. Aver, David Overstreet had, had found, that the knowledge that elders bring. And then we, we were able to utilize the University of Wisconsin Extension Office to, to bring resources that we did not have to better enhance our educational programming. Um, really one of the first things we did was we brought in a 4-H program that we co-located here on the, on the campus where I was a supervisor and a member of UW Extension was a supervisor. And now all of the UW Extension offices are located here on the Menominee uh, campus. Next slide. So again, like I said, we're building the relationships. Um, it was, it was, it takes a long time, but that's the best way to partner is to first build that relationship. Uh, we found you need to be able to listen, and and listening's hard. Um, you need to you need to understand that that you you can't always be talking. You have to be listening. Uh, we we learned that we need to put egos aside, uh, try other cultural perspectives, um, focusing on separating intent from impact, and then. Uh, building those relationships from the upper administration all the way down. So our president and the and the folks at UW Extension, they met and we all met and then we would work together as a group. And that, that relationship built this team where Jennifer had mentioned we, we have this co-location of the 94 and 1862. Next slide, please. So what's brought to the table? Um, we bring things we each bring things that the other can't. Um, sometimes we have we have the ability to to tap into resources that uh, UW Extension cannot. Other times uh, we we can they can they have resources that that we do not. Um, so and that that kind of um, that makes makes us helps us to decide who should be responsible for what. Yeah, but we always work together. And and uh, you know, I think that the big thing. The big lesson learned out of it is that uh, through that relationship, we're able to have those those frank conversations uh, with each other on who should lead at any, give, any given point because uh, um, you know we we trust each other and understand we're we're all working for the right reason. Next slide. There were road roadblocks and there still are. Um, the, you need to understand that there will be roadblocks when you're trying to to build a partnership. Um, we needed to overcome, and we still do, with the institutional memory of, of some hard hardships that occurred, um, some bad feelings, uh, when there was no partnership, but, but that's slowly going away. And, uh, and finally, um, there always are and always will be financial roadblocks that we, we need to deal with. So um, those are some of the roadblocks. Next slide. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Janie, Jennifer, and Brian for the comp, the, your comments and perspectives on food so sovereignty and the uh, other work that you each are doing. Uh, this is a, a time for question and answer. Uh, I, I do want to uh, 
to share that. Renee Wallace, who normally uh, moderates this part, had to step away. Uh, so I'm uh, covering the, the question and answer portion. And uh, we've actually had a number of questions that uh, uh, Janie has uh, answered and some of our other presenters have, have answered. Uh, so please do ask some additional questions. There's one outstanding question that uh, perhaps Janie can, can um, answer, and that would be to share a bit more about servant partners and the NAFFF resources. Uh, Janie, would you uh, be willing to uh, unmute and just uh, make a few comments about that? I thought you unmuted me, Rich. <laughs> okay, we can unmute you. <laughs> no, I did, I did it myself. Um, if you can hear me okay, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I think Brian and Jennifer both kind of picked up on this, um, the, the issue of servant um, relationships, if you will. And, and, it's, and Brian, you, you literally just talked about it in your last slide or two uh, there at the end. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I have had stories told to me of, of failed relationships um, between uh, tribes and, and native, native nations and uh, the land grant system kind of writ large. Um, and I do believe that if we go about it with the right intention that we can create new relationships. Um, but that's what I meant by that um, is literally going into, um, if you've never worked with native nations, then do your homework and show up in a respectful way and try to understand as much as you can about their history and what their focus is. And don't come in thinking that you know everything um, because quite frankly, none of us know everything. And you will be surprised how much you learn if you come um, in that um, humble way. And that's really what I meant, Rich, uh, by that. I will tell you NAF um, as an entity, um, is going to be as strategic as it possibly can be over the life of the funds. We're required to spend down the entire amount um, by 2038. However, I, I personally think we're not going to have too much of a hard time doing that because there's so much going on right now um, that, is, um, that should be supported. Um, I think our real role is going to be in finding um, finding as many ways that we can leverage the funds that are in the fund um, to achieve even more impact over time. And I bet Brian, Jennifer, and, uh, and Rachel, Aaron, I bet all of us are nodding our heads that that is something that should be done because we can greatly magnify what, the NA what NAF is capable of doing in this time period if we literally um, think outside the box and figure out how we're going to um, have the greatest impact. Um, it's, it would be very easy for Brian to come to the fund and literally not think about what, how his work really impacts a broader community. But it's my hope that we really think strategically uh, across the whole system, um, not just um, the land grant system writ large, uh, specifically tribal colleges, but also that we think about how uh, tribes can enter, do intertribal work. Um, that's really important to do. So anyway, that's what I meant by both of those things. I hope I answered your question, Bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. You have. Uh, we do have uh, two other questions, and I think the first of these certainly would be open to all three of you. The question is, communities overall have lost the idea of food sovereignty. How do we start recovering this in our communities? What guidance can you share? And that would be open to all three of you. Anybody willing to take an initial uh, response? I'm gonna throw Brian and Jennifer under the bus. <laughs> but I think Menominee actually has, has a really good model. There's several other tribes across the country that are doing a great models. It, it literally just requires you to kind of sit down and start assessing what's going on within your own community around food and around agriculture production, I think. Menominee did that in the beginning and really engaged across the community. But that's just one idea. I'm sure Brian and Jennifer have others. 
Right. Yeah. So I think when the when the work first started, I think that there were a lot of service providers that were so hyped up and so interested. Um, people who had attended the nutrition conference and all of these other great indig indigenous ag conferences and would come back and have all these ideas and all this energy and jump in and get started. But it wasn't really what the community was looking for. And like I mentioned, it's like we weren't speaking the same language with each other. So Brian and I sat together and we wanted to figure out what is it that the community wants and we set up listening sessions and um, just had a conversation about what is food sovereignty to you um, and that kind of helped set the stage like here's what we need to focus on here's where we need to go Brian yeah, I would agree I was just gonna say you know I think it, surprisingly when when you start to pull all that together like Janie had mentioned there is there is a lot of that work going on already I mean people uh, are all, already doing some of these things to to grow their own food and and it's just a matter of, of, of teaching it and, and getting that outreach and education out there, um, you know, so everybody can do it. Yeah. Very good. We have, we have, uh, we'll we're going to do one more question. This would be open to all of you. Uh, and then we're, we're close to closing. That question is, do you foresee a benefit to include a food sovereignty course within a native studies degree program? And I, it's cut off. I can't see it, it says at a, at a university, okay, at a university. So uh, all three of you, uh, uh, any comments on that question? This is, uh, well, this is Brian, but but yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, actually, you know, we're, we're at the college here, we're actually in the process of developing a sustainable egg program um, and, and definitely food sovereignty will be included in that. And, you know, it's our hope that, that it's open to everyone uh, that's really interested in, in uh, you know, sustainable egg is important. Um, it's, it's definitely not just a buzzword anymore. It's something that we all need to look at and, and not just natives, but everyone needs to. I think it's important, you know, for the livelihood of the country. Any other uh, comments from either Jennifer or Janie? I would just echo Brian's comments. Uh, it is necessary. Um, what you'll find though, as you're putting it together is that there is no one way to do this, <laughs> like Jennifer said. And, and what you really do see is just so, I, I think the, that that kind of a course obviously can take a very specific, you know, local look, but um, it could very easily be even more expansive across um, the continent literally, because there's so much going on. You're gonna probably feel feel like you have to have two or three semesters at it, <laughs> as opposed to just one. <laughs> Thank you, Janie. And Jennifer, any, any comments? Uh, no, I, I, I love the idea of having a sustainable ag course. Uh, I think that our community and our youth need to know our history and be proud and to know that they were the original farmers in this area we now call Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we're, there are several other questions. We only have time to have brief responses on one more. Um, the question that I'm going to pick here is, uh, could some examples of assessments and surveys be shared with the participants. We certainly can add those when we send out the recording and the, the slides, but does anybody have any quick responses about assessments and surveys? Sure. Um, Brian and I have been um, really using the First Nations Development Institute tools. Uh, they have a host of tools and resources in there. They're culturally appropriate. You might need to do some adaptations with them, but they've been really helpful with us getting to the issues. And Jennifer, I was going to suggest the same thing. That tool is a great uh, point of <laughs> launching off. I'm, I'm not sure how to change much about it other than to tweak it locally, but it's amazing how much you can surface up using the food sovereignty assessment tool. Great. And what, uh, Brian, any last comment on that question? No, I, you know, I guess I, you know, I agree with, with both Jennifer and Janie. Um, you know, Jennifer and I used, used those tools and uh, with the community and, you know, they, they really were very much appropriate for the community. So they were very helpful. Very good. We have two or three other questions, but we're, we're, we've run out of time. We just have one more slide to do to close. We'll try, we'll make sure that these questions 
uh, are shared with the uh, with the presenters. Uh, there's only two or three more, and we'll make sure that uh, uh, at least try to facilitate that you, if you pose the question, you'll get a response. So uh, let me just uh, uh, close here by just saying that again, this this webinar is sponsored by the Racial Equity in the Food Systems Work Group. Uh, the, uh, this uh, this group is national in scope, uh, and, and as you've heard, we, we sponsor many webinars. The last was on racial equity metrics. Uh, the next uh, Racial Equity in the Food System webinar will also cover food sovereignty, but with a focus on African-American communities and, and perspectives. And uh, we just want to thank you again. The, the link to the webinar recording, the slides will be sent to all uh, webinar, not only participants, but registrants. We actually had well over 650 registrants, and we have a really high level of uh, people looking at the recordings. The, the support for the Racial Equity and Food System Group comes in part from the Kellogg Foundation. Uh, I want to end by uh, honoring and thanking um, Janie, Jennifer, and Brian, and for the members of the Racial Equity and the Food System uh, Webinar Planning Committee, and for our IT person, uh, Gwyn, for their work in offering this webinar. Um, thanks to you all. Peace and respect to all of you from the Racial Equity and the Food Systems Committee. And until our next uh, webinar, uh, please uh, take care and be safe, and we're ready to sign off. Thank you.